We found out about Kira, that Kira was going to have medical problems when I was pregnant with her at 29 weeks. Um, we went for an extra sonogram because I didn't feel she was moving as much as she had in the past. And we were told um, in the office that she was going to be profoundly disabled when she was born. When you find out that your child is um, different from other children, you go through a grieving process. You grieve for the child you thought you were going to have. Welcome everyone to Family Comes First. I'm Vincent J. Russo. And I'm Victoria Roberts-Drogan. Thank you for joining us today. Today we are going to learn about what happens to our medically fragile children. The term generally refers to children who require complex health procedures, special therapy, or specialized medical equipment or supplies to enhance or sustain their lives during the day. Uh, sounds like uh, there are a lot of issues and challenges there. Until the 1980s, medically fragile children were most often cared for in hospitals and then institutions. Thank God for deinstitutionalization, which started with Willowbrook. This resulted in children being moved into community settings. In addition, advances in healthcare technology have enabled more children with special needs to leave hospitals. Vincent, I know this is very personal for you. Sure. Uh, you and your wife, Susan, brought your daughter, Teresa, home to live with you. And as you know, more children are leaving hospitals, which puts extreme pressure on these families to provide for their children, who require more medical equipment and 24-hour specialized care. This all comes at a very high cost, emotionally, physically, and financially. And that's where community organizations like Angela's House can be a lifesaver. Absolutely, Victoria. Today, we will share the Altbacker family with you, Liz and Chris, and their three beautiful children, Kira, Sydney, and Timmy. Their oldest daughter, Kira, has multiple challenges that require constant medical care. She is medically fragile. Mm -hmm. The Altbackers brought Kira home, and their lives have never been the same. They are an extraordinary family. Sure. Before we sit down with the Altbackers, however, we are going to present a wonderful resource that does amazing work for the families of medically fragile children. Angela's House helps care for these children living at home with parents or in special homes that offer 24-hour nursing support. We are fortunate enough to have Bob Palacostro, the founder of Angela's House, with us today, and your partner, Vincent, yes. <laughs> Frank Buquicchio, a special needs planning attorney who helps families plan for their child with special needs. Before we talk to Bob, however, today, we're going to take a tour of Angela's House. It's absolutely fantastic. We were fortunate because in, in seeing that a small setting would be perfect for these kids, then we can do everything in the world possible to make the environment that they live in like their own house. You know, that warm, fuzzy feeling, and then it helps the parents a lot because the parents see them in a comfortable home. It's not this large institution that they feel like their child may get lost in. When you enter the house, we, we try to be just like you would enter in a regular home. We try to have the kind of feel that is that formal, not so much formal for us, but you know, formal living room area. To have a den where the kids could spend most of their time there was important to us because we didn't want them in the room. We wanted them to be together. We wanted them to be in a environment where they would build camaraderie, and that has been to me, one of the most beautiful things to witness over the past 10 years. As you swing from there, we have our kitchen, which is right off of the den area. And that's, a, that's an area that is, you know, where we have all the, the food that we do for the kids and prepared uh, meals and, and any of the uh, specialty formulas that the kids would need. And then that's kind of the main living space. As you walk further into the house, that's where you get into the first room that you see is the nursing station, the central area, you know, which is most important during the nighttime. The rooms, we, we wanted them to be almost beyond what you would see in your own home. As my kids say, these are nicer than they would ever see. And that was kind of, that was kind of our goal because we, we wanted them to be very colorful. Behind me is, is a mural that was, it's a, it's a very festive environment. It's almost like an underwater party. The restaurant is behind me with, with just fish playing musical instruments and everybody just being happy. Our feel is to try to give the children as much 
of a, of a normal life as possible. It's like a dream come true for us and for the family. It's been a challenge because as we've come across more and more families, you know, we, we've seen that many parents would love and it's the initial desire to be able to care for their kids at home but they know they need that support in order to make that possible it gets hard and and, I, and it saddens me because i see many of them without an alternative and then it it makes it even more difficult to understand that there's nothing even planned for them and that's that's why i refer to it as a crisis because i don't see the light at the end of the tunnel for them Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank Bob, you, Vincent. Thank you, Vincent. Welcome. Thank you. And I have to say, after watching that extraordinary piece, the most powerful moment in looking at that clip for me was when we walked from the den into the nurse's station. And I, I had this feeling that what you've done is you really, you created a home from a hospital. We can't thank you enough for all the good work you're doing. And I know for us, it started with Teresa. For you, it started with Angela. I'd love to hear more about Angela. Well, the traumatic experience of, of her birth is, is really where, unfortunately, it was a horrible twist to what was going to be a beautiful experience of having our second child at the time. But we, we knew at that point we had an angel. Mm -hmm. And that's where we named her being uh, Angela. Beautiful brown-eyed, dark-haired mm. little girl that meant the world to me just to hold on to her. Mm. And just being in the hospital was not where I wanted to be. I wanted to be home with her. And I understood that it's not where the kids belonged. And it was my desire to have an experience where parents wouldn't be stuck in hospitals. How long did you have Angela for? It was 13 months. Mm. And after her first birthday, and she passed, uh, unfortunately, she was actually up in Connecticut because mm -hmm. there was limited resources here on uh, Long Island, actually pretty much across the country, being able to care for some of these kids outside of the hospital. And you and, you and your wife ha had the inner strength and faith uh, to move forward, understanding what you went through and not wanting that for other parents, and you created Angela's house. And like you said before, you know, you, you, you have a child like this, you go through that experience, something you, you never forget. It's, it's a world, you know, as we would refer to as the new survivors, kids that people never thought would survive or people that never thought that the technology would be able to be there for them to continue their life and to support them. Mm -hmm. I knew right away that it was gonna be difficult to try to take her home. Mm -hmm. I also didn't want to see her in the hospital. Mm -hmm. After she passed, I realized that there were very few advocates, you know, because even where I was coming from, I didn't have anybody kind of helping us out. And I knew I had to continue. I knew the parents that I had met in the hospital and the parents I started to meet in the community needed the same thing that my wife and I needed that wasn't there. So that's when we spent our time just advocating, mm -hmm. talking mm -hmm. to everyone we could, every elected official that was in uh, the downstate area and said, you know what, we have to change this. These kids should not be living in a hospital. Yeah. And you created what you needed. Absolutely. Yeah. And starting from ground zero, in a mm -hmm. sense, mm -hmm. right. we had the opportunity. You know, we didn't want an institutional-looking situation. We wanted sure. something that made everyone comfortable, something comfortable for the children, something comfortable for the families, and even the staff, a very home-like, mm. warm environment. So... You've created these residences, which we saw, which are extraordinary. Um, and I'd like to, we would like to hear mm. a little bit about the services they provide. And also, there must be many families who can't possibly be accommodated within the few houses that exist. So could you tell us about... Yes, we've been blessed to have two homes. Mm. Well, I've actually, I've worked with a great agency on Long Island to work these homes and it's IGHL independent group home living and it's it's been very important to make it a success mm. but I've also as, as the years have gone by I keep on meeting more and more families and it is tragic that we don't have more alternatives for these for these children but I understand too then what has to happen is we have to support them more 
coming out of the hospital and then support the parents when they're home. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge undertaking. And that's where we're seeing more and more of the families. The last two years, 400 families a year that we're trying to Say help that again. stabilize. Say that again. How many families? 400 families just oh. in this region. Just in this area of Long Island. Yes. We're mm. making a difference because I know that it wouldn't be possible in many cases for the parents to be able to care for the kids' home without having people there to kind of walk them through the process of helping them get everything from the nursing care in-house to get the funding sources in the home, mm. to get the medical supplies and equipment, therapies and so on. It, it's really an overwhelming task to try to even to do it alone as a parent. Mm. That's, that's the word, overwhelming yeah. task. and, and uh, it all, it all, it all um, started with this gift from God, yeah. Angela. It as, all started as, with as Angela. I, as I said, you know, as tragic as that moment was in my mm -hmm. life, that of the trauma of and devastation that we, mm -hmm. uh, you know, experienced at our birth, we knew we had an angel, and and we were blessed. I was blessed with that one year with her, and yeah. it was it was fantastic. And I and I feel that every day of my life. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know you do, Frank. Uh, you're the special needs planner, and you're seeing parents on a regular basis who are coming in the office with their concerns. Can you sh up front just share what concerns do you hear sure. from these parents? I think uh, two main concerns, and you've both touched upon one, which mm -hmm. is, you know, w what services are going to be available for my child, and how can I afford that? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the second, probably the most pressing for the parents, is what's going to happen when I'm gone? Mm -hmm. you know, what's going to happen to my child? Who's going to take care of my child? Those are big concerns. Yeah. And that second one is the toughest, yeah. as Bob and I both know. Um, many parents don't even want to think about it or are horrified. To, to think about if that be, was a reality, where would we go with it? Yeah. Um, just uh, quickly, can you uh, talk about um, a couple of the planning uh, steps that you'd recommend for parents? Sure, sure. The first thing I do when I meet with parents with uh, a child with special needs is to understand and listen to what their concerns are. Um, and then I advise them of uh, uh, their legal tools. Mm -hmm. um, the memorandum of intent is one very important document. And of course, having a will with a supplemental needs trust to protect the child when the parent passes. Both very important documents. Terrific. I know there's a story, Bob, as to how you and Vincent met. Um, would you I'm both gonna, tell I, us a little bit? Sure, I'll start the story, which is uh, I just felt uh, that I needed to know this man and needed to know all the good work that uh, Bob was doing. And, and so about 18 months ago, I uh, called him up and said, let's go to lunch, and we went to a nice Italian restaurant, of course, <laughs> and uh, we were talking, and we immediately connected, and Bob was sharing uh, with me the angel of hope, this vision that he had mm -hmm. uh, for the angel of hope to be erected on Long Island, mm -hmm. and the struggles of, of having, that, uh, having that happen, where would it be, and um, I said, we're right across from where our daughters are buried at Holy Rood. We got Eisenhower Park right here. After lunch, you have to go to Eisenhower Park. Bob? And I'm, we, we say goodbye. It was a great meeting. And I'm sitting in the parking lot. And I'm like, let's, let me go. Let me go. It's right here. You know, I, I, I grew up locally. I knew Eisenhower Park. So I, we took a, took a ride there. And as soon as I saw the monument area and I saw how beautifully kept it was, I, I realized this is it. This is it. And as I'm there, the, the wildest thing happened. I end up meeting a, a friend of the families that I hadn't seen in over 30 years. And he has also been involved with helping parents and helping groups get, getting monuments in the park. And I knew at that point, without mm -hmm. a doubt, that this was the place that it needed to be. Because mm -hmm. I, I understood that parents that have lost children yeah needed to have this monument that has actually been replicated in over 100 areas of the United States. So today we have and the was, a angel, angel of hope. Mm -hmm. Th thank you for being here today mm -hmm. and all the good work that you're doing. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you. And for more information on Angela's House, uh, you can visit their website at www.angelashouse.org. And when we come back, we will sit down with the Altbacker family, uh, truly an inspiring family. Stay with us.
We found out about Kira that Kira was going to have medical problems when I was pregnant with her at 29 weeks. Um, we went for an extra sonogram because I didn't feel she was moving as much as she had in the past. And we were told um, in the office that she was going to be profoundly disabled when she was born. At three months old, Kira started physical therapy through early intervention. Um, shortly after that, she started occupational therapy, speech therapy, and special ed. Um, we had therapists in our house three to four times a day, five days a week. When you find out that your child is um, different from other children, and especially when you find out that they are medically fragile, handicapped, you go through a grieving process. You grieve for the child you thought you were going to have. Um, and it takes a long time. For me, it took five years because every milestone that Kira didn't hit was another time to grieve because you lost that child. Um, but eventually, and it happens to different people at different times, eventually you come to accept it and this is the child you have and you're grateful for the things that she can do. We waited to get pregnant with our second child. We were nervous about what was going to happen, but because what happened to Kira was not um, genetic, it was not hereditary, the chances of us having a child, a second child with the same thing were very slim. Having three children in diapers is very difficult, plus the added fact of having nurses. And we were very much fortunate to be supported by our family. Um, our families live close. We um, depended on them a lot. If we did not have the help from Angela's house, we would not have been able to keep Kira home. We, would have not, uh, we wouldn't have been able to afford the things that we needed to um, have a normal family life. So if it weren't for Angela's house, we would be in a very different situation than we are today. Welcome back to Family Comes First. Today we are talking about taking care of our medically fragile children. We are now joined by Liz and Chris Altbacker and their family, Kira, Sydney, and Timmy. I know Angela's house has played a, an important role uh, in your life. Uh, and in our, um, we had a video of, we literally got a tour of Angela's house by Bob Polo Castro. They do what they do very, very well. And Bob is very knowledgeable. Um, on all the programs that the states and the local counties and districts offer. Um, and he passes that on to his workers. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Now we have to... Uh, it's, it's near impossible for a family starting out to, to even navigate through all, you know, the, the paperwork and, and the different branches that you have to go through and whatnot. And, and the caseworkers were just absolutely phenomenal. You know, these are professionals that know the system, know how things work and can just pinpoint and go directly to where you need to be, you know, and uh, yeah, it's it just helped immensely. We have the kids here. I, and I want to talk to you guys. Um, you feel like talking a little bit? A little bit? <laughs> well, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about Kira and about what makes her happy, what she likes to do. I know we talked um, a little bit about her birthday. Yeah. What happens on her birthday? Um, she likes to, um, well, when we unwrap her presents, mm -hmm. we like, um, she likes to play with the wrapping paper and tears it up and stuff. Sounds good. Sounds makes crinkly. Makes a smile. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. What makes her happy is when you take a towel and you flap it in front of her face. Oh. And the air makes her smile. Oh, because it feels good. It's a breeze. Yeah. You know, is it hard to find time for yourselves? <laughs> to yeah. get together, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, possible. Yeah. Yeah, usually one of us is attached to the house with Kira uh, to one extreme or another. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but uh, yeah, it, it, at times, you know, mm -hmm. at times it, it, it's harder on one than the other and mm -hmm. we, we take turns taking up the slack and whatnot. But yeah. Yeah, it's tough to find time together, mm -hmm. you, you sure. know. What are your hopes for Kira's future as she gets older? I think we've always felt that we just want her to be comfortable. We want to balance um, medical necessity with her comfort and happiness. You know, I know from my own experiences and, and representing many families who have children with special needs, how expensive all of this can be. And, and how do you manage financially? And We were fortunate enough to be in the Care at Home program. Fantastic. Which, which is, is a, 
it's a, well, there's a county level program and then there's a statewide program. Um, there are different levels of care at home. And without that program, our lives would be completely uh -huh. changed. Um, we have, a, we do have terrific insurance, but um, it doesn't cover everything. Right. Things like diapers and certain medicines, certain equipment. Um, so without the care at home program, which is how we met up with Angela's house, we would have to have paid for all of it out of pocket. The modifications to your house, a ramp. Um, nursing services. Nursing yeah. services. Yeah. So talk about yeah, those you services could, you could, that you get through care at home. You could quickly home. go into severe debt. Yeah. You know, um, care at home, it depends on what level you're in. Mm. But um, in a nutshell, they help you modify your house to make it wheelchair accessible. They help... Um, modify your bathroom. They've also helped us get a hospital bed, um, various wheelchairs. Eventually we'll need a chair lift into our car and mm. they'll help with that. You know there are different levels which you've mentioned and there are different eligibility rules that apply under Medicaid and the, these programs are called wavered programs. Right. And so people, uh, parents can have some assets and income and still be eligible. So I, I think Medicaid is based. The care at home program yeah. is based on the child's disability, not on um, the child's income or the parent's income. That's right. So uh, for those who are watching who have a child like Kira, uh, it's important that they um, apply for benefits. Mm -hmm. Don't don't automatically I mean, assume yeah. you're not eligible for them because you may find that there are services and and those services are critical, like you, you mentioned. Uh, what does it mean for the two of you having the family that you have today? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> That's a big question, okay. right? I, I, I think, I think I we think, held our breath for a while. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'd say. But I, I think it was a little easier <laughs> since Kira was the first, yeah. you know. Um, for me especially, I, did, I didn't know any different, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, for, for Sydney and Timmy to come along then to, you know, two other blessings, uh, you know, and uh, where their ranges, everything, their milestones, you're just like, wow. You know, wow, 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 you know, and then it was just, yeah, it was definitely a decision. We always said we wanted to have more kids and it wasn't going to hold us back. Having them, I think, mm. it, it mm. saved us because it was, it's a lot of work. You're not only a parent, you're a doctor, you're a nurse, mm. you're, and Sydney and Timmy, they bring so much happiness to us mm. that uh, it was important to have them. If there's one message that you could send to our viewers who... Uh, have a family similar to yours with a child who's medically fragile. What what message would mom and dad like to send? Well, I would just say, I would say life is what you make of it. You know, you can let it bring you down, and you can stay inside, and you can board yourself up, or you can, you know, go out and do things, and and you know, do things with your child and everything like that. And you know, we're th that much richer for it because we do. You know, <laughs> there are times where yeah, where you're tied to the house, but there are other times where you know you're out and about, and you know, she loves to go to the supermarket, and she loves, <laughs> you know, to go to the soccer games on Sunday and stuff like that. So, you know. It's, you know, <laughs> life is what you make of it, and, you know, if you dealt lemons, make lemonade. Yeah, well, thank you so much for sharing your family and your story, and I know uh, that many of our viewers are going to be inspired, uh, and, um, and I can't thank you enough, and, and Sydney and Timmy, thanks so much for joining us. It's been great. You thank guys you. are thank a you. wonderful family. Thank you. Thanks. And now we're going to turn to Monsignor McNamara for a spiritual reflection. Liz and Chris experienced the trauma of their first child born profoundly disabled. They obviously love her very much, but they face challenge not only with Kira, but with the plan to have more children. I was very touched by Liz's realistic statement that you grieve for the child you thought you were going to have. Eventually, she rejoices in the things that Kira is capable of doing. They find support with other families and through the services of Angela's house, a safe place that enables them to keep Kira at home and to receive some respite for themselves. 
here at Holy Cross, we have a wonderful program called Faith and Light, where families meet for mutual support on the first Friday of the month and come to pray together. It's a beautiful group, just as the Outbacker family is a beautiful family. God bless them. When a child has profound disabilities and complex medical needs, providing the needed round-the-clock care can be exhausting and overwhelming. Though sometimes it may seem daunting, with the love and support of family, children who are medically fragile can grow and thrive at home. That is certainly true, Victoria, and it's certainly evidenced by the Allpacker family. They show that a loving family is the best medicine for Kira. That's right, Vincent. And with help from organizations like Angela's House and your law firm, families can continue to provide a loving home for their children. For more information on resources for special needs, please visit www.vjrussolaw.com. <laughs> and for more information on Angela's House, go to www.angelashouse.org. And I would like to add one more resource, the Teresa Foundation. Oh. Uh, at www.teresafoundation.org, started in honor of your Teresa. Very much appreciate that. And our Teresa Foundation supports music, dance, art, and recreation programs. And we've opened the Teresa Academy of Performing Arts for children with special needs in Lido Beach. For more information, call the foundation at 516-432-0200. And it is truly a joyful and inspiring place. Today, our hearts have been touched by Kira and her loving family. It makes me happy to know that we are all one big family, mm -hmm. helping each other. Thanks to all our viewers for joining us today. And remember, family truly does come first.